Well, there's nothing better than men singing the gospel. Thank you guys. Thank you, Joan, for accompanying them. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. If you didn't bring a Bible today, that's okay, but we are going to spend most of the rest of our service studying the Bible, and so there are Bibles available in the back of the pew in front of you, and today we'll be on page 149 of the back section, which is the New Testament of that Bible. If you think about it, the experience of every Christian is like an inmate being released from prison, but directly into a war. When God declares us justified, not because we're actually righteous, but like the men just sang, but because Jesus was righteous and because he endured the sentence of God's wrath for us, that frees us Kind of like getting out of jail from bondage to sin and the certain and rightful experience of enduring God's wrath. But as you know, we are not justified directly into heaven. There is the day to day experience that we all feel every moment of every day of sanctification or becoming more and more like Jesus in a world that tempts us and afflicts us. None of us would go back to being under the sentence of death. Right? We, don't, we don't want to go back to prison. But we aren't in heaven yet. So according to Paul, we are freed into a fight. Galatians 5.17 for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another. If you're a Christian, at the moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit walked through the front door of your life, if you will, and he dropped his bags, and he promised never to leave. The Holy Spirit indwells you. But the ugly flesh doesn't leave either. The flesh no longer has power over the house, but the flesh does try to run the house. And the persistence of the flesh is impressive. So every day, there is a civil war within every true believer. For the mature Christian, this civil war or this battle within is not a surprise. This is one of the reasons, because we're so familiar with this battle, and we frankly grow weary in it, that we pray like John at the end of Revelation, even so, come, Lord, quickly. We long for this war to be over. We long to be made completely pure. But the fact that there's this ongoing war raises another question. Is winning now before heaven possible? And if so, how do we win now? Well, according to Galatians 5.16, we win by walking. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. In this case, the word walk means to follow, like a faithful disciple follows a mentor or teacher. As we learn the will of the Spirit, in the Word, He guides us to follow Him in submissive obedience. That's walking in the Spirit. We actively follow His objective leading, and in doing so, 
We're able to cut the fuel to the flesh every day. Now that is a quick summary of what we studied last week. And that was the first part of a three-part sermon that Paul preaches at the end of Galatians 5, which means we have two parts left. The first of those two sermons today is on the topic of the flesh. What is the flesh? How do we identify it? Next week, the sermon is on the Spirit. What is the Spirit? How do we know we're walking in the Spirit? How do we identify that and live there? And so with all that in mind, let's read the entirety of this passage because it all fits together. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 16, we'll read down through verse 26. But I say... Walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Verse 18. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, And things like these, of which I warn you, just as I have warned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22. This is next week's sermon. So please come back next week. If you find yourself on the brink of despair, wanting to quit the Christian life altogether, Don't until at least after next week. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Verse 24 Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. The last two paragraphs, if you will, of this three-part sermon... Paul announces the war within, much like you would announce the beginning of a a prize fight. In this corner, the flesh. And in the other corner, the spirit. Today, just like last week, we're going to learn two principles, two more timeless Christian life principles about what it means to live out the Christian life. Paul wants the Galatians, he wants us, to be able to identify when we are winning and when we are losing. How do you know when the flesh is getting the upper hand? How do you know when you're successfully walking in the Spirit? Well, Paul says in Galatians 5.19, right in the beginning of our text for today, it's evident. Or, if you are inclined to write in your Bible, you might write next to the word evident. It's obvious. When it comes to the flesh, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Paul wants us to be able to see when we're giving in to the flesh So, to that end, he gives us three categories of indicators. We're familiar with 
the idea of indicators. If there is a fire in your house, you might smell smoke. Okay. That's an indicator. You might actually see the flames. Okay. That likely is not the fact that you're hallucinating. Okay. Your house is on fire. You might hear the beeping of a smoke alarm. Indicators are good. As much as we hate the indicator lights on our dashboard, we would prefer to have them there and let us know something's wrong with our car rather than operating our car past when it needs to be in the shop for a repair. And so Paul gives us three categories of indicators to let us know that the flesh is getting the upper hand. The first category is sexual indicators. Sexual indicators. And there are three of them. Before we look at them, I think it's important for us to note that according to Paul and the rest of the Bible, sex is not the problem. Wrong sex is the problem. Teens, young adults, did you hear it? I want you to hear it. I want you to hear your pastor, one of your pastors say, sex is not bad. Wrong sex is bad. God designed sex. He designed sex as a satisfying celebration of the oneness between a husband, that's a man, okay, and a wife, that's a woman. The Scripture celebrates sex. God dedicated one whole book of the Bible out of only 66. One whole book is dedicated to the commendation and even the illustration of the fullness, the pleasure of sex in marriage. The book of Song of Solomon. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul not only instructs, he really warns husbands and wives not to abstain from sex. Sex is good in marriage, and abstaining from sex in marriage puts you in a position to be tempted. So Paul says, be faithful. Honor your spouse. Serve your spouse. The author of Hebrews reminds us to keep the marriage bed undefiled. Well, we can keep the marriage bed undefiled because the marriage bed is undefiled. Sex is not the problem. Sex is not an indicator of the flesh getting the upper hand. That's really bad teaching. Wrong sex is an indicator that the flesh is getting the upper hand. Sex is wonderful, beautiful, even necessary within the bounds of marriage between a man and a woman for life. But outside of those boundaries, it's fleshly. So here in Galatians 5, Paul uses the same three words, although in a different order, that he uses in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 21. And apparently, in Paul's mind, these words are all-inclusive. So the first word that he uses is the word immorality. This is a general word for sexual sin. This is sexual sights and thoughts like pornography. This includes sexual words like sexual jokes and innuendo. This includes every kind of out-of-bound sexual action like premarital sex, homosexuality, sex with multiple partners, prostitution. We could go on immorality. The second word that he uses is impurity, which focuses on the defilement and the filthiness that's generated by sexual sin. Envy, guilt, rage for when I'm not satisfied as I think I should be. Sensuality, this third word emphasizes the lack of restraint and unbridled passion 
of sexual license. This is, this is, when it comes to sex, simply throwing off all restraint and then kind of flaunting the fact that you're living however you want. If a sexual thought comes into my mind, I act on it, whatever the thought is. We discussed this in our study of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 19. And they, this is the world, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. With greediness. I want more. I've already removed all the, all the biblical restraints on any kind of sexual morality, and I want more. I remember when I was in high school, I can tell you what room I was sitting in, in our school building, in a government and economics class, when our teacher told us about the homosexual agenda and, and what was happening in pockets of our country, which now has become fairly normal. And, and he showed us the rainbow flag, which, I mean, instantly as a Christian young person, I thought, how sad that they would try and co-opt something that actually is a, a promise of God and use it for their own devices. It's not good. But what has become, and, and, and look, we as Christians have enough things that we need to work on ourselves. My point is not to bash those outside of the faith. Our, we move towards them with the loving compassion of the gospel that God can rescue you from your sin into a relationship with him. So, so my heart is not to bash those outside of the faith. But how sad it is to watch, even over the last 10 years, as that flag has evolved, have you noticed? More lines, more arrows, more symbols. It's, it's Ephesians 4.19. It's, it's the sensuality that's referred to in Galatians 5. We're just going to we're just going to add categories for everything that we can imagine. Our 11th and 12th, 12th grade Bible class is studying existentialism, postmodernism uh, versus uh, a biblical worldview. And we were, we were just talking about this on Thursday. How does a young man in high school decide that he is actually more of a girl and begin taking steps to change his anatomy. A and now he actually wants to act out like a feline girl. So he'll, he'll wear a headband that has cat ears. How, how do we get there? Well, the answer is we move away from objective truth. It's important to note that godless culture doesn't just tolerate these sexual deviations. They celebrate them. Sexual impurity is worn as a badge of honor. You say, Pastor Reason, why are you talking about sex outside of our world? Here's why. Paul pushes back against that in the church. That's the whole point. You can't give in to the flesh. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, they're not to be named among you. The presence of these kinds of out-of-bounds sexual indicators in your life, they're functioning like a fire alarm or lights on the dashboard. They're letting you know flesh is getting the upper hand in your life. But Then Paul moves on to a second category of indicators that the flesh is winning in your life. If we were making a list, probably to our shame, I think we would tend, I would, have left this category out. I, I would have thought of more ugly, external, sinful things. But certainly, these flesh indicators often slide in under the heading of acceptable sins, when in reality, they are flashing, blinking lights, air raid sirens are going off, when it comes to this second category, something is terribly wrong. These are worship 
indicators, worship indicators. We were made to worship, and we do worship every day. I, I've often joked that um, on, on eight or nine Sundays in Colorado in the fall, the largest worship center in our state is about three miles from here, okay? Mile High Stadium. Worship is ascribing glory to something or someone or making it the object of reverence and affection. The first two commandments address the matter of worship. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't make any graven images. Why those first? Because there's only one God, there is one God, only one God, who is rightfully jealous of all our loyalty, affection, and reverence. So one of the indicators of the fact that the flesh is getting an upper hand in our life is the presence, according to Paul, of idols. Not just actual graven images. I think as Americans, we would say most of us are too sophisticated for that. But idols of the heart. Good things become bad things when they become ruling things. Things like respect or honor or affection, or comfort, or security. Things that we'll sin to get, or we'll sin if we don't get. So Paul mentions idolatry. One commentator says, this fundamental sin in Pauline theology, did you catch that? This is foundational. This is where it grows from. Is the failure to praise and thank God for His goodness And to turn rather to the worship of idols, to worship the creature rather than the creator. But Paul pairs up idolatry with sorcery. And certainly sorcery has the overtones of witchcraft and the occult. And that is, in fact, condemned repeatedly in the Old Testament. But to understand sorcery as it's used here in Galatians 5, I think we have to ask a question. To what end would you engage practices of the occult? To to what end would you engage witchcraft, magic? Why did people 2,000 years ago use magic and engage fortune tellers? Here's the answer in an attempt to know or dictate the future. Here's the bottom line regarding this sorcery. It's an attempt to bypass resting in the sovereignty of God. It's a dark way to attempt to take my my own future into my own hands. You see, that's why I say these are subtle, foundational, but air raid siren type sins. If idolatry suggests the lack of satisfaction in God, I'll worship something else that gives me a greater, a, a greater uh, sense of value. Then sorcery suggests a lack of confidence in God. And both are indicators that the flesh is winning in our lives. So that's two categories. You want to know if the flesh is getting the upper hand in your life? Well, is, is there the presence of out-of-the-bounds out of bounds sexuality? Is there the presence of misplaced worship? Which brings us to the third and longest category of flesh indicators. The last category is twice as long as the first two categories combined. Did you catch that in our reading? If you're genuinely concerned about the war between the flesh and the spirit in your life, the best way to know if the flesh is winning is to look at your relationships. I want to throw out a word of caution. Most of us live our lives with the camera of our life facing out, okay? We see what other people say, what other people do. 
We read their body language. We, we try not to assume motives, but with actions and words and body language, sometimes we assume maybe this is what's going on in their heart. Most of us very rarely turn the camera and look at our own life. See, this is exactly what James was referring to in James 1, where he says, the Word of God is like a mirror. It allows us to see our own thoughts, our own words, our own actions. And James says in James 1, something we pray almost every week here, don't be like the person who looks in a mirror and, and they, sees that, they see that their hair's disheveled, they can see that there's, maybe in the first thing in the morning, there's buildup in your eye, eye gook from overnight. See that you're not shaven properly and there's maybe stuff growing on your teeth. This is exactly what James 1 says. I'm not kidding. And he says, if you see that and you walk away and don't do anything, You have a problem. Here's the problem. You don't understand the meaning of a mirror. And so most of us can see the, the fleshly indicators in the relationships of other people, especially in their relationship with us. And we go, that person's really hard to live with. They tend to explode when certain buttons are pushed. But can we see that in our own lives? I know this is true of my own life. When God is at the center, and I'm really being led by His Spirit through His Word, I am from the heart patient with others and others-minded. But when the flesh is winning, I am something else. Once again, leaning into James, James says, if you have bitter jealousy, chapter 3, ambition in your heart, don't be arrogant. So lie against the truth. That kind of wisdom, this bitter, selfish, quote-unquote wisdom, is not that which comes down from heaven, but it's earthly, natural. We we, we, we can kind of pause there and we're like, okay, yeah, I am flesh. You know, I guess I should expect that sometimes I'm going to, you know, I'm going to act out towards others, calling it wisdom. But look at the last word James says, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. So what are the relational indicators? We'll have to move through them quickly. How do we know that the flesh is getting the upper hand in our life? First of all, enmities. This is deep-seated hatred. This is kind of foundational to all of the others. A love that Christ has for me has not transferred to the way I love others. Strife. This is partisan. Uh, this This is fussing against others because you don't like the way, the side that they have chosen. So this is partisan and not just politics. Jealousy. This is the same word that's used to describe God's expectation of singular reverence and worship. And see, that becomes a problem when we apply it to humans. We're, we're pretending ourselves to be God. Everybody else should worship me. I, should, I have a kind of God-like expectation of abundance and glory. Jealousy. Outbursts of anger. This is what it it sounds like actual explosions, out of control, often profanity-laced, scorched earth explosions towards others. Disputes. This is contentious and lingering disagreements. You, you've heard about a land dispute, right? Land disputes are very rarely solved in a week. Okay? They can go on for generations. This is the inability to just let it go. 
to agree to disagree agreeably. I have to keep bringing it up. I have to win. The next two, dissensions and factions, go together. Dissensions is a rarely used term in the New Testament. It kind of slides in next to factions. These are disagreements that lead to the creation of opposing groups or parties. You've you've heard about this in churches before, right? The side that's for brown carpet or brown paint versus gray carpet. Gray paint. This is what was going on in the Corinthian church. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Christ. And then there's envying. This is a desire to possess what someone else has. Often we limit this to things. I mean, I like cool cars. I, I, I don't know that I've ever owned a, owned a cool car. I don't think my cars are not cool. I should probably rescue all of us from this rabbit trail. This is not in my notes. But I do like cool cars. Yesterday morning, I was at the intersection of 32nd and Youngfield. I was going to turn south, and the light was red, and I, I couldn't turn, so I pulled up next to an old Porsche. And there was a younger couple, maybe 10 years younger than Bethany and me. The, the top was down, and they were just loving life. Right? Honestly, I could say I thought it was cool for them, but I didn't envy it. It wasn't like, man, I wish I had that parked in my garage. But I do envy. For me, envying is most obvious with relationships. Or look at somebody else and it's like, man, it, it seems like everything just seems naturally well for them. Or circumstances. The last two on the list may fit into a category of their own, or they may be the pleasure side of relationships gone wrong. Well, while the, the first eight may be friction, may represent friction in relationships. These may involve relationships that are built on uncontrolled pleasure. And that's what I think. Your relationships should not be characterized by anger or friction, and they shouldn't be characterized by unrestrained, uncontrolled partying. Both are evidences of the flesh. Paul refers to drunkenness. That's lack of control, Ephesians 5.18. Control that's been given over to something else. Something else now is, is controlling me. Carousing, this is parties or orgies by those who have given themselves over to drunkenness. Together, we just throw off all restraints and do for a season whatever we want. Now, to be sure, that is a lot, isn't it? <laughs> be warmed and filled on a Sunday morning, shall we? Paul's actually not done. He says at the end of, or the middle of verse 21, envying drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. This list is not intended to be exhaustive. His point is, when the flesh is getting the upper hand, true Christians know it. And I think, I think that's actually the main application from that long list and the few words that precede it. Don't Lie to yourself. Don't give in to unrestrained sexual passions and say, I I'm good. Don't look out over the landscape of relationships in your life that are marked by relational carnage and say, hey, we're okay. I mean, this is normal for people under the sun. Don't lie to yourself. These are indicators that the flesh is getting the upper hand. Which leads us to the second principle. We can't ignore consistent flesh. We can't ignore consistent flesh. Paul gives us a little bit of a backstory that we didn't know until now, towards the end of Galatians 5. Paul tells us that when 
I preached the gospel to you. I preached about Christ crucified, that you are saved by grace through faith alone and not according to the law. And for four and a half chapters, I harped on the fact that you can't abandon the true gospel by adding law-keeping to it. But guys, remember, there's something else I preached to you too. And that is you can't go off the other side of the cliff and just live however you want. I'm warning you now, just like I warned you before. And what is the warning? Here it is. These words are as significant and weighty as they appear to be. Those that practice such things, what are such things? It's everything in the list that preceded this, including things like these. But those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We need to make some more notes in our Bibles if you're inclined that way. You might want to circle the word practice. Practice. This is continual or habitual, unrepentant sin. Paul is not teaching that true Christians never sin. That would be contrary to the storyline of the gospel and the direct teaching of other portions of Scripture. Think 1 John 1, 1 John 2. What Paul is teaching is true Christians don't claim that they can do whatever they want so that grace may abound, Romans 6. True Christians appreciate that they have been saved unto a new life, also Romans 6. True Christians appreciate that they have been saved to be a special or peculiar people, as Titus 2 tells us in the King James. And so they don't continue in known unrepentant sin, waving the white flag of surrender and assuming that's okay. Practice can't practice these things. According to verse 21, and keep in mind, this is directed towards professing Christians. If you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we're going to understand what this means, it's important that we accurately define then the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Now, to be sure, this is something of a theologically sticky question. How you answer this suggests your kind of method of interpreting portions of the Scripture. The way I see the kingdom of God, especially in the New Testament, and I I really have a hard time seeing it any other way, is in three different uses. The first is a spiritual kingdom where Christ reigns over all true believers. In that sense, if you're a real Christian today, you're part of the kingdom of God today. Christ reigns in your heart. The second use of the kingdom of God that I see in the New Testament is referring to the millennial kingdom where Christ will reign for an actual thousand years on earth, and that is a fulfillment of many of the promises to Israel in the Old Testament. The third use is the eternal kingdom, where all sin will ultimately be punished. Every knee for all of eternity will bow before Jesus, some in judgment, many, by God's grace, in worship for all of eternity, say, well, which one is it referring to here? I believe it's all three. We're talking about real believers who are presently indwelt by the Holy Spirit, over whom Jesus is reigning as king, who he will reign as king over during the millennium and for all of eternity. If it is your normal practice 
to give in to the flesh and it doesn't bother you and you don't meaning you don't fight back you don't seek help if there is practically no difference between you and an unbeliever by that i mean your values your words your thoughts your behaviors here's what i understand paul to be saying to you you have no biblical grounds for assurance that you are either currently in or will be in the kingdom of God in any sense. We might be able to try and do some interpretive gymnastics to work around this in one text, which I don't think is wise, but some try to do it. See, the problem is, this isn't problem. You understand what I mean by problem. The problem is, this isn't an isolated text or theme. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Ephesians 5, 5. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater, sounds an awful lot like Galatians 5, doesn't it? They do not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. 1 John 3.10 By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. I think there are a couple of apologetic questions, theological apologetic questions that this raises that are worth answering before we conclude. The first one is this. Some might say, well, what difference is there between these three verses and the first four and a half chapters of Galatians? I mean, isn't what Paul's saying then that our salvation, our justification is dependent on our law-keeping or our works? The answer to that is an unqualified nope. There is a big difference between making works, good works, and a changed life, the roots of our salvation, rather than the fruit of our salvation. This is not good works or denying the flesh. This is not what produces salvation. Rather, this is what salvation produces. In Romans 8, this is part of a string of salvation. Those whom God foreknew, He also predestined. Those who He called, He also justified. They will be conformed to the image of His Son, and then they will be glorified. If there is no evidence of sanctification, then we should have no confidence in justification or glorification. What Paul is teaching in Galatians 5 is not at odds with justification by faith, nor is it at odds with eternal security. You would, you would read this and wonder if Paul is saying to the Galatians, some of you have fallen into these kinds of sins and you're unrepentant in it and therefore you must have lost your salvation. No. John 10 tells us, Jesus said, that no one can pluck true Christians out of the Father's hand. Romans 8 teaches us that you're Nothing can separate us from God's love. 1 John 2.19 teaches us, There are some, however, that have gone out from us because they were never of us. So what is the point? The point of Galatians 5 is not that you can lose your salvation. The point of Galatians 5 is that if your life is marked by continual 
unrepentant sin, especially when you've been confronted by it by unbelievers, and you continue in it unrepentantly, waving the flag, white flag of surrender. And maybe that white flag of surrender is, I've tried, I quit. Maybe the right, white flag of surrender is, I, I just don't think this is really that important. Either way, it may be evidence that you were never truly a believer. So I think it's important that we make this point. Those that practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That represents a warning for our own lives and for the way that we engage other believers. This is a warning for our own lives and the way that we live life alongside other believers. Think with me quickly about Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is in the context of the church, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Okay, this is a church. Within the family of, of Christ in a church, we have an obligation to each other. And what is that? If we see the flesh getting the upper hand in another believer's life, we don't rob them of the privilege of church restoration, even discipline. And so we go to them. Say, brother... I'm hoping that you have a good explanation for this that's different from what I see. But here's what I see. It looks like in this area of your life, sin is getting the upper hand, and even furthermore, it looks like you're not addressing it. If the person is unrepentant, then we take another or a couple others with us. We have that same conversation. If they're still unrepentant, Scripture says we take them, we take it to the church. And if they're still unrepentant, with the whole of the body is coming alongside them and saying, I see these indi sexual indicators. I see these worship indicators. I see these relational indicators. And all of them seem to be screaming, you don't know Jesus. Then we treat them like an unbeliever or a Gentile. Does that mean we shun them? No. Here's what it means. It means that we withhold the warmth of Christian fellowship with them, meaning we don't, we don't treat them just like they're any other believer. Rather, we evangelize them. We call them to repent and believe in Jesus. This is why the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So here's the second main application. Don't sleep on sin. Don't sleep on sin. Not in your own life and not in the lives of others. While you're packing up, because I know you're packing up, I have a few deeply held preaching convictions. And one of them is this. I don't believe that it's always wise to take three verses like this and to try and soften them by saying all the other things that the Bible says about the flesh in the preaching moment. Here's what I mean by that. The, the Bible does teach about how to address the flesh. That you reckon or you consider it to be dead because as a Christian its power is broken over you. That you make no provisions for the flesh. In other words, you don't go out of your way to make it easy to sin. You go out of your way to make it hard to sin. Make no provision for the flesh. Mortify the flesh. Kill sin, or sin will be killing you. Meaning, the Bible does give a pathway forward with the flesh. But Paul doesn't make any of those points in these three verses. 
Next week, we'll get to the indicators or the fruits of the Spirit. That's why I said, please don't leave the church after this week. If you're going to leave the church because of the preaching, at least wait till after next week, right? We'll talk about how not to give into the flesh. But in these three verses, Paul wants us to be sobered, to feel the weight, to experience the rebuke or the confrontation of the Word. Don't lie to yourself. When the alarm's going off, and for some of us it's an air raid siren, don't lie to yourself. Those are indicators. I'm living in the flesh. And furthermore, this is consequential. Eternity's in the balance. I am burdened that the church, meaning the big C church, including this church, needs those two applications. Don't lie to yourself. And second, don't sleep on sin. We'll continue from here next week. Let's pray together. Father, you have told us that your word is good for doctrine, and for reproof. But I pray that every one of us, as we take your word with us and leave this auditorium, would seriously consider, is the flesh getting the upper hand in my life? And if it is, I pray that we would search our hearts if we're in Christ, oh, that we would repent and experience the joy of forgiveness, claiming the promise that if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, if, if the indicators of the flesh are such that it's clear that there has never really been that work of regeneration, a new life, the, the wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit guiding us in the truth, convicting us, pointing us to Christ. Lord, I pray that even today some would call out owning their sin, claiming Christ's work on the cross for them, and trust Jesus as their Savior even today. We're so thankful that your word is so clear. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and together our church family said, Amen.